Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Our focus today is Pakistan and frankly it's hard to settle on one headline from Pakistan. The economy is a mess, they urgently need money but they're getting no bailouts. The political crisis continues, the army may be mulling a snap election so the new prime minister is already fighting to keep his chair. And a civil war looms with the chief minister of one province vowing to pit his police against the central force. Now in any other country this would be a major internal crisis or a series of crises. But in the case of Pakistan, it's a global security crisis because Pakistan has terrorist groups and nuclear weapons. So any kind of instability makes it a deadly situation. On Gravitas tonight, as we break down the crises with the numbers and the developments, we also look at what the government is doing to contain it. Prime Minister Sheba Sharif is in Turkey as we speak. Can he survive these challenges and remain in power? Or is Pakistan heading for an early election after all? We'll discuss all of that. Politics in Pakistan has always been unstable, but even by Pakistani standards, the chaos of the last 10 weeks has been unparalleled. First, the unceremonious exit of Imran Khan, then the violent freedom march. Now Pakistan is staring at an economic collapse. It is dangerously short of cash. It desperately needs a bailout. Pakistan needs $36 billion. But no one wants to help it. Creditor after creditor is rejecting Pakistan's loan request. And these setbacks have triggered speculation. Some reports say the army could pull the plug on the Sharif government. So can Sheba Sharif save Pakistan from an economic collapse? Or should he worry about saving his chair first? On Gravitas tonight, that's what we'll discuss. Now, you already know that Pakistan's economy is in a mess. We've been reporting on how it could go the Sri Lanka way. Pakistan's foreign reserves are rapidly declining. They have a little more than $10 billion left, and that's not enough to cover even two months of imports, $10 billion. Plus $3.2 billion worth of debt payments are pending. So the threat of bankruptcy is real for Pakistan, which is why they turn to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. The talks failed. The IMF told Pakistan to tighten its belt first, to cut expenses and losses, to reduce subsidies. Only then will the IMF agree to a bailout. So Pakistan began exploring other options, but they've had no luck. One option is to issue bonds to raise money, but Pakistan cannot do it because it has been shut out of the global bond market. Another option is friendly governments. Well, even they are not willing to help this time. Pakistan reached out to Saudi Arabia, the UAE and China. They've been generous donors in the past, these countries. But not this time. Pakistan's finance minister, Miftai Ismail, explained why. I have this, his statement with me and this is what he said. We went to Saudi Arabia, Dubai and spoke to other countries. They are ready to give money, but all of them say we need to go to the IMF first. So that's what Pakistan's friends are saying. You can have the loan, but conditions apply. And the condition is that Pakistan must go to the IMF first, get a bailout from the IMF, and then borrow from friends to fill the gaps. And it's a catch-22 situation for Pakistan. It is going to others because the IMF has not given it a bailout. And the others say they will not give money until the IMF gives a bailout. So they're stuck. Now, why is the IMF not helping Pakistan? Because Pakistan has made a habit of it. 
It has been bailed out 22 times, more than any other country in the world. 22 bailouts. Pakistan has spent more years inside an IMF program than outside it. And now it wants bailout number 23. But it will have to earn it. Agree to some tough conditions. The IMF has made five demands. Number one, end subsidies on fuel. Number two, raise income tax. Number three, increase tax on individuals who, ru who run businesses. Number four, cut subsidies on power. And number five, recapitalize two private sector banks. And these are tough demands for any government. For a government but for a government as precariously perched as the one in Pakistan, some of these may be impossible to meet. The Sharif government recently conceded on the first demand. They hiked fuel prices. But what about the rest? They're non-committal, and we know why. Tax hikes and subsidy cuts are unpopular decisions. Shehbaz Sharif faces an election in a year if he's lucky, in a few months or weeks if he's not. And just before an election, austerity measures is the last thing you want. What's making it even more complicated is the military. They're not sitting on the sidelines on this one. Recently, Rawal Pindi called a meeting. The agenda was to discuss the way forward with the IMF. Some key stakeholders were present in this meeting, including two former finance ministers, a former governor of Pakistan's Reserve Bank, and two technocrats turned politicians. They met with the senior leadership of the Pakistani military. There's talk about an interim government. This is being touted as the solution to Pakistan's current problems. The military believes this is unsustainable. So they are said to be exploring the possibility of early elections too. Reports say they've already started consultations. And let me repeat, these are reports at the moment. Some of it is speculation. But none of it can be ruled out given the fragility of civilian governments in Pakistan. So this is what we have. Barely a month into the job, Shehbaz Sharif is already fighting to keep power. The economic crisis is a test for his government. Sharif's survival depends on this. He's now making a trip to Turkey. Shehbaz Sharif is traveling with a high-level delegation to Turkey. The focus is on the money. Pakistan wants investment. The economy is driven by consumption. It makes up for 75 to 80 percent of Pakistan's GDP. So trade deals and more investment will help Pakistan's economy. And these deals might help Shehbaz Sharif buy some time. Unfortunately for him, Turkey itself is fumbling on the economic front. Well, we say good luck to both of them. And while Shehbaz Sharif is jetting around in West Asia, back home, his country is descending into chaos. Ministers are being targeted with rockets. Provinces are in open rebellion and terror groups are being legitimized bad signs for any country. Worse, if you're sitting on a pile of nuclear missiles. Let's start with Khyber Pakhtunwa. It is Pakistan's smallest province. But for Shehbaz Sharif, it's a big headache. Why is that? Because Khyber Pakhtunwa is ruled by Imran Khan's party, the Tehrike in Saf. It is a new battleground for Sharif versus Imran. On Saturday, the province's transport minister's home was attacked. Rockets were fired by unidentified assailants. The minister's drawing room was partially damaged. Fortunately, he was not at home. And this is just a sample. This political rivalry has moved beyond parliament and democracy. This is now a street fight. It is pitting government against government. The chief minister of Khyber Pakhtunwa is in open rebellion. He's an ally of Imran Khan, and he's willing to test the limits of his authority. Listen to his latest threat. Now, in most countries, that's a civil war. The chief minister is openly threatening to deploy his police forces. Against whom? the federal government of Pakistan. Imagine what that would look like. Khyber Pakhtunwa cops on one side, Pakistan's federal security forces on the other. At the center of the standoff is the former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Last week, he issued an ultimatum to Shehbaz Sharif. He said, hold snap elections in six days, else get ready to face more protests. Well, that deadline, the six-day deadline, ends today, and Shehbaz Sharif has no intention of announcing elections. So the ball now is in Imran Khan's court. Does he organize another march to Islamabad, or does he hold back? Last week, he chose option number two. He held back.
When Imran Khan's convoy entered Islamabad, clashes broke out. Cops and party workers were fighting on the streets. Apparently, this violence discouraged Imran Khan. Listen to this. Us din khoon kharaba hona tha. Hamari police ke khilaf nafrate badni thi, bad chuki thi. Mazid aur badni thi. Lekin police bhi apni hai. Police ke aam log, police walon ka kusur nahi hai. How thoughtful of him. Imran Khan has suddenly remembered law and order. He wants to prevent bloodshed. And this time he's betting on the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Imran Khan is filing a petition at the top court. He wants the court to protect his party workers, to stop the police from cracking down. How has the court reacted? Well, they are already, they'd already given permission last month. But that was for peaceful protesters. And we're not sure if Imran Khan's gun-wielding hooligans fall in that category. Whatever he decides could shape Pakistan's future because right now Imran Khan is going after everyone, the army, the politicians and now the Supreme Court. He says this is a trial of Pakistan's top court. And who presides over that trial? From the looks of it, Imran Khan himself. And this is a dangerous situation for any country. An ousted leader detached from reality, thousands ready to march on his command, and chief ministers ready to rebel against the capital. The perfect recipe for anarchy. And in Pakistan, anarchy usually means opportunity for the army, for the terrorists, maybe even foreign powers. And one group will be watching these developments with particular interest. The TTP, the Harike Taliban Pakistan. Today they announced an indefinite ceasefire with the government of Pakistan. It sounds like a big win. But there's more to the ceasefire than just the headline. For starters, guess who brokered this deal? The Taliban. The negotiations were held in Kabul and the chief negotiator was this man, Haqqani chief slash Taliban stop cop Sirajuddin Haqqani. He's friends with Pakistan's ISI, so this time he helped out. But can the Taliban alone tame the TTP? Chances are it cannot. The Taliban are themselves grappling with multiple problems. Attacks by the Islamic State, a rampant food crisis, international sanctions. So the Taliban's priority, top priority, is not the TTP. It is their own domestic crises and concerns. And the TTP knows this. They can use Afghanistan as a launch pad whenever they want. Just look at the terms of today's ceasefire. Pakistan's government wanted the TTP to disband, to lay down their arms, but the TTP has refused. So clearly, this is not a long-term commitment. This is a delaying tactic at best. But a delay for what? More instability. Imran Khan is serving up enough distractions for the government. He is peddling conspiracy theories, arranging long marches, basically setting the stage for extremist groups. In most countries, this would be a political crisis. In Pakistan, this is a global security threat. Speaking of which, Russia's war in Ukraine has crossed 100 days. Remember all the expert predictions in January. Turns out they were wrong. For 100 days, Ukraine has successfully resisted Russia. The question is, what happens next? What is Vladimir Putin's plan B? According to some reports, Donbass, he wants to defeat the Ukrainian forces in the east to carve out Donbass from Ukraine and then perhaps end the war. And one city is key to that plan, Sieverodonetsk. It is located in the Luhansk province of Ukraine. Half the city is under Russian control, the other half is with Ukraine. Many are calling it the next Mariupol and I'll tell you why. This city, listen to this, the city was bombed 200 times in one hour. That's more than three bombs per minute. Almost 120,000 residents have already fled the bombing. Around 15,000 civilians are left. If Russia takes the city, it would be a strategic win, a massive foothold in the Donbass. Even President Volodymyr Zelensky admits the situation is tough. In general, the situation in Donbass remains extremely difficult. The Russian army is trying to gather a superior force to put more and more pressure on our defenders. There, in Donbas, the maximum combat power of the Russian army is now gathered. Tiavero, Donetsk and other settlements remain the key target for the occupiers on this axis. Now more than ever, Ukraine needs its allies and chief among them 
is the European Union. The EU has been Putin's credit card during this war. Every day he's drawing millions from Europe. On Monday, the EU tried to correct that. Well, did they succeed? Yes and no. Russian gas has not been touched. Instead, they've sanctioned Russian oil. By the end of 2022, Europe will cut Russian oil imports by 90%. All seaborne imports will be stopped. Only pipeline oil will be imported. Why the exemption? Because as usual, Europe could not find consensus. Landlocked countries like Hungary and Slovakia protested. And these numbers should tell you why. 96% of Slovakia's oil is imported from Russia. 56%, 58% rather, for Hungary. Without the pipeline oil, these countries would run out of energy. So they got exemptions. For other member states, there is a deadline. Six months to phase out crude oil, eight months for refined products. But will this partial ban be enough to deter Russia? First, let's analyze the numbers. Russia exports 2.2 million barrels of oil to Europe every day, plus 1.2 million barrels of oil products. This trade is very lucrative for Russia. They earn around $1 billion per day, $1 billion every day from Europe. If you cut that by 90%, Russia will feel the pinch. After all, half of Russia's oil ends up in Europe. But I repeat the question, will it be enough to deter Russia? That depends on two things. Number one, can Russia find new buyers for its oil? Three million barrels is a lot of oil to sell. Countries like India and China have increased oil purchases since the war, but they cannot compensate for three million barrels. Factor number two, how long can Europe sustain this ban? Eurozone inflation has hit 8.1%. That's the highest level since 1997. If you cut 90% of Russian oil, that will only increase. And don't forget, by the end of 2022, Europe will be in peak winter season, not the best time to run out of oil. So Europe has about six months to find alternatives. The, the U.S. has released some of its strategic oil reserves, but that is, alone is not going to be enough. The West needs the Gulf states to step up. The likes of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, except they're not willing to. Reports say OPEC, the oil cartel, is sticking to their previous agreement. They have no intention of increasing output. So this partial oil ban is a 50-50 call. If Europe can handle the bitter pill, bad news for Russia. Because who knows, maybe a partial gas embargo will be next. As for Vladimir Putin, it means the window is closing. He has two options now, either wrap up the war quickly or offer some concessions to the West. And this weekend, he did exactly that. Putin offered to reopen shipping and grain exports from the Black Sea. Today, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov reaffirmed that. He said Russian ships would ensure the unhindered passage of cargo ships. Now, why is this important? Because Russia and Ukraine are sort of like bread baskets. They make up 30% of global wheat exports. Since the war, that export has virtually disappeared and the result is a global food crisis. If shipping resumes, Ukraine can export wheat again. In fact, Russia claims to be a step ahead. Let me show you some pictures. These were released by Russia's defense ministry. And they show the first cargo ship leaving Russian-occupied Mariupol. Now, we cannot verify these pictures, but if they're true, Black Sea shipping could resume soon. It's a good fix, but it's not a permanent one. The permanent solution is a peace deal, and that means making concessions. Both Ukraine and Russia need to have a frank conversation. Just think about it. Before the war, Volodymyr Zelensky refused to accept neutrality. After days of bloodshed, he relented. And that mistake must not be repeated. There is no point in fighting till the end only to accept the same demands later on. There is no bravery in that. Instead, Ukraine must seize this opportunity. If Russia is looking for an exit, don't block it. That is the only way to save innocent lives. And speaking of saving innocent lives, climate change is back in news, not for its perils, the ones it's causing, but for the activism around it. At a recent convention in Germany, Chancellor Olaf Scholz was interrupted by climate change activists. 
He responded by calling them black-clad enactments from a time long gone. It's unclear what he was referring to, at least he's not made it clear. But climate activists say that he was comparing them with black uniformed SS officers of Nazi Germany. And they want him to clarify and issue an apology now. Scholz's supporters say he should not. They say climate activism these days is indeed getting problematic. That the tactics being adopted by activists are a bit radical. Here's a report. Climate change is real. Science has proven it. From shrinking ice sheets to rising sea levels. From extreme weather events to record high temperatures. The evidence for this phenomenon is compelling. As is the activism around it. Across the world, climate activists are trying to make a difference. They are working overtime to raise awareness and push world leaders into action. Some are holding protests. Others are blocking roads. Some are picketing infrastructure. Others are smearing cake on paintings. <laughs> to be fair, these tactics can yield significant advantages for their causes. They can make policymakers take the issue more seriously. But do they constitute the right approach, the right way to change public opinion? It's a question many in Germany are currently asking, courtesy German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. He has been accused of comparing climate activists with Nazis. A charge his spokesperson has called absurd. Here's what happened. On the 27th of May, Scholz was speaking at the German Catholic Convention. The moment he mentioned loss of mining jobs in Germany, he was interrupted by climate change campaigners. This is what he had to say in response. I'll be honest. These black-clad enactments at various events by always the same people remind me of a time that is, thank God, long gone. The German Chancellor did not elaborate what he meant, but observers have interpreted his remarks as a reference to the Nazi era, a time when SS officers clad in black uniforms patrol the streets. Climate activists are upset with this. They want an apology. Leading the call is the Fridays for Future movement. It has written an open letter to the German Chancellor, seeking a clarification at the earliest. Last we checked, Scholz had refused to give any, neither a clarification nor an apology. His supporters say he doesn't have to. They are pointing to disruptive climate protests, slamming them for causing nuisance to the society. The methods in question include interrupting speakers, throwing glitter bombs, choking traffic artilleries, even physically attacking politicians. For climate activists, these methods are the quickest and most effective way to push for change. But for critics, these tactics classify as climate fatalism, something that transgresses moral boundaries, disrupts law and order, causes damage to public property and leaves a negative impact on public opinion. So, which side is correct? It's a debate that is not ending anytime soon. Now, climate activism may be up for debate, but here's something that's not. China's plans for Taiwan. Right from the start, Beijing has been clear-eyed. Taiwan must be brought under Chinese control, even if that means invading by force. Monday was further proof of it. China sent 30 warplanes into Taiwan's air defense zone. 30 planes in one day. It was the biggest Chinese incursion since January. And how did Taiwan respond? By sending fighters of their own. Eventually, the PLA jets buzzed off from the air defense zone. But the standoff is far from over. With each incursion, China is becoming emboldened. Each time, they're sending more and more jets. So what's their game plan here? 
two parts to it. A, to test Taiwan's defense capabilities, their response times, their aerial capabilities, all of it. And B, to keep Taiwan on their toes. Think back to Joe Biden's remarks last week. He promised to defend Taiwan if China invaded. Comments like those are a shot of confidence for Taiwan perhaps a precursor to China's worst nightmare, a formal declaration of independence by Taiwan. That is China's worst nightmare among its worst. So these incursions are sort of like a reminder, a rude but powerful reminder. And Monday's incursion had the perfect trigger, a high-profile visit by U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth. She represents the U.S. state of Illinois. Now this visit is important for two reasons. One, because... Senator Duckworth belongs to Joe Biden's Democratic Party and two, because she's a retired Lieutenant Colonel of the U.S. National Guard. In fact, she's a staunch advocate of stronger U.S.-Taiwan military cooperation. Last July, Senator Duckworth was one of the main sponsors of the Taiwan Partnership Act, which received bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress. As a result, the U.S. Department of Defense is now proactively planning cooperation between the U.S. National Guard and Taiwan's defense forces. Senator Duckworth also recently introduced a bill that further prioritizes Taiwan's security as a part of U.S. military deployment in the Indo-Pacific region. If Chinese planes are threatening Taiwan, it's Chinese ships for the Philippines. China has imposed a unilateral fishing ban on waters near the Spratly Islands. Fun fact, these islands actually belong to the Philippines, not China. This was recognized by a United Nations court in 2016, but China does not seem to care. They claim almost the entire South China Sea. PLA ships routinely sail through these routes. They enter sovereign waters. They harass fishermen, more like pirates than a navy. But this time, Manila has had enough. They summon the Chinese ambassador to register their protest. Even the language is strong. China's activities have been described as clear violation of Philippine maritime jurisdiction. So the Philippines is standing up to China, but for how long? Pretty soon, there will be a new president in Manila, Bongbong Marcos. Right now, he's still the president-elect, but on the 30th of June, he will officially take charge, which means a new administration, a new foreign office. And rumor is, Bongbong Marcos is closer to China. A couple of reasons for that. One is that his family has cases pending against them in the United States. In 1995, in fact, a court in Hawaii ordered Marcos to pay $2 billion to the victims of his father's rule. That order is still pending. Reason number two, Bong Bong's China connection goes way back. In 1974, he visited China as an 18-year-old. There are pictures of a beaming Bong Bong meeting Mao Zedong. Having said that, the new president cannot openly embrace China. After all, he's a populist. And populists cannot sacrifice on territorial integrity. If they do, they will lose public support. Bong Bong Marcos is towing the same line. He plans to uphold the UN verdict of 2016. At the same time, he plans to have warm ties with Beijing. Tough job, isn't it? Almost as tough as trapping tiny islands in your security net. I'm talking about China's Grand Pacific Pact. It turned out to be a grand failure. We told you about it yesterday. But Foreign Minister Wang Yi is not done yet. Despite the setback, his island hopping continues. Today he was in Tonga. He met the Prime Minister and the King. He signed a couple of bilateral deals, but nothing substantial. Certainly not a defence pact. But knowing China, they will try again. And next time the outcome could be different. I'll tell you why. Two-thirds of Tonga's external debt is owned by one group. China's Export-Import Bank. At the same time, their biggest donors are Australia and New Zealand. Now do you see the problem here? Debt is a legal liability. You pay up or you face action. But donations do not work like that. And most Pacific islands are grappling with the same dilemma. Chinese debt on one hand, liberal democratic principles on the other. They stood up for principles this week. But to sustain that choice, they will need assistance. So this is what we have in the lineup. There's an economic crisis in Pakistan, a trade war in Europe a global climate crisis, and China is flexing its muscle at sea and in the air. Who do you think will address these problems? One would think the United Nations, 
The UN is supposed to maintain peace, dignity and equality on this planet. The world body was founded in 1945. It is tasked with solving global issues and armed with multiple units to carry out this task. But 77 years later, the UN has failed on every possible front. Two recent events headline this failure. One, you have North Korea chairing the UN disarmament body. And if that's bizarre, you also have the United Nations praising China's quote-unquote tremendous achievements on human rights. This is China, the perpetrator of the Uyghur genocide, and now it's short of receiving a human rights award by none other than the United Nations. This is what happened. The UN Human Rights Commissioner was on a six-day tour of China. She visited Xinjiang. She saw the atrocities that China was committing on Uyghurs. It was a guided tour. But Michelle Bachelet did not condemn China. Instead, she chose to praise President Xi Jinping and his men. And you have to hear her to believe it. Poverty alleviation and the eradication of street poverty, 10 years ahead of its target data, date, are tremendous achievements of China. Tremendous achievement. The UN human rights body is praising a country that's orchestrating a genocide. Earlier this week, the UN appointed North Korea as the chair of the disarmament commission. North Korea, one of the biggest weapons proliferators in the world. It is currently sitting on top of a nuclear disarmament forum at the helm of a forum. One observer equated this to putting a serial rapist in charge of a women's shelter. North Korea became the chairman of the World Disarmament Forum on Monday as we speak. It is leading a body that's supposed to regulate, limit and reduce arms, even weapons of mass destruction. Days before taking over this chairmanship, North Korea fired three ballistic missiles. And this has been a pattern for a while now. The United Nations has been missing no opportunity to fail the world. In 2019, when our world was facing an unprecedented crisis, when the Wuhan virus began breaching borders, the World Health Organization was busy covering up for China. It wasted time. It delayed the declaration of a pandemic. And then it failed to hold China accountable. In 2020, the same UN made a mockery of itself again. Its human rights body held an election and they elected China and Pakistan as members, some of the biggest human rights violators in the world, given a seat at the high table to sit in judgment of others. Earlier this year, the United Nations' incompetence was broadcast live to the world when Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. The United Nations Security Council held an emer emergency meeting. Ukraine's ambassador openly challenged the UNSC to stop the war. Poverty alleviation and the eradication of street poverty 10 years ahead of its target data, date, are tremendous achievements of China. Well, that was Michelle Bachelet talking about what happened in China and her visit to Xinjiang. But coming back to the war in Ukraine, lip service was all that the UN Security Council could offer to the Ukrainians. Apologists say the Security Council has its hands tied because Russia had the veto power. It also had the presidency of the Security Council then, and that's why, that's precisely why we say the UN system is broken. It needs reform. It needs to disarm the P5 of the often abused veto power. The United Nations is sitting on a budget of $3.12 billion. It's an enormous outlay. But where's this money going? If this money is being spent on peacekeeping, how is it that at least six countries are currently at war? If it's being used to end hunger, why are 811 million people going to bed hungry every night? If the UN is supposedly using this money to protect human rights, why are minorities being persecuted worldwide? The UNSC sat back and watched every time a human rights violation was committed. When the Taliban took over Afghanistan, the Security Council once again proved itself to be futile. There is no peace in the world today because this peacekeeping body has failed. The United Nations has become a tool in the hands of powerful countries. Its verdicts are not enforceable. Its representation is dated. It has failed to reform. Today, the United Nations cannot even prevent a war. It cannot act or react when faced with a pandemic. In short, the United Nations today has become nothing but a giant bureaucratic mammoth sitting on piles of money 
and delivering nothing except perhaps bureaucratic warnings that most of the world tends to ignore. The United Nations has issued one such for Iran. It has made a big claim. The UN says Iran can make a nuclear weapon. It claims that Tehran has enough uranium for a bomb. The impasse over the Iran nuclear deal allowed Tehran to build up that stockpile, but the Iranian regime is facing a backlash from within. Massive protests have broken out against the establishment. Our next report tells you why. The United Nations is worried about Iran. The world body has been probing the Iranian nuclear program, and it doesn't like what it sees. The UN says Tehran has enough uranium to make a nuclear bomb. Traces of uranium have been detected at several sites. The metal is a key ingredient for a bomb. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, seems to concur with the UN's assessment. It says Iran has around 43 kilograms of uranium. It has been enriched to 60%. To make it weapons grade, you have to enrich uranium to 90%. Reports say Tehran is a couple of weeks away from getting there. Iran has refuted all of this. Unfortunately, the report by the IAEA is not fair and balanced. It is fair that political pressure by the Zionists and others have made the reporting deviate from technical direction to political direction. We expect that this behavior is corrected. That message was also for the U.S. and allies. For more than a year now, they have tried to revive the Iran nuclear deal, but they haven't had much success. Tehran has demanded a major concession to return to the agreement. It wants the US to stop calling the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps a terrorist organization. Washington has been reluctant. So Iran continues to raise the stakes by enriching more uranium. It may be negotiating from a position of strength with the West. But within Iran, the regime is on weak footing. There is a growing public anger against Iran's political leadership. This month, the country has witnessed large-scale protests. Rising food prices forced thousands of people to hit the streets. Last week, the public anger boiled over. A 10-story building collapsed in southwest Iran. At least 31 people were killed. Once again, the Iranian establishment was blamed. Tehran tried to contain the damage. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei dispatched an emissary to speak with the angry locals. It didn't end well. Ayatollah Mohsen Haidari Ali Qasir tried to engage with the crowd. Hundreds had gathered to hear him at the same site where the building collapsed. The moment he started speaking, the crowd shouted him down. Iranian state television was broadcasting the speech. It quickly cut out of it once the protests began. A crackdown by Iranian riot police followed. They fired at the protesters. In the past, Iran has managed to crush protests like these. But this time, the crackdown has led to a strong public reaction. The protests are intensifying. Amid the growing scrutiny of nuclear watchdogs, Iran's leadership is facing a serious challenge to its grip on power. Now, if you're missing some drama in your life, we suggest you forget Netflix and start following British politics instead is guaranteed to give you a daily dose of suspense. Every day is supposedly Boris Johnson's last day in office. And every day the British Prime Minister proves that he has more lives than a cat.
Today, Invincible Bojo is fighting a villain called John Stevenson. He's a Tory MP and he submitted a letter of no confidence against Boris Johnson. Stevenson says he's deeply disappointed. Why? Because of the findings of the Sue Gray report. Quick recap. Sue Gray is a British civil servant. She was tasked with probing into the lockdown parties hosted by 10 Downing Street. What did Sue Gray find? Excessive drinking, mistreatment of cleaners, multiple breaches of lockdown rules, numerous parties throughout the lockdown, gatherings everywhere from the Downing Street garden to the cabinet room. How did Boris Johnson react to all of this? Well, he could not bother less. He offered what he called an apology, and now it's business as usual for him. Currently, Johnson's in recess. He's threatening civil servants at home, telling them that he will be firing a few. As we speak, Boris Johnson has become extremely unpopular within his party. A popularity survey among conservatives has found that Johnson ranks at the bottom of the cabinet. The majority feel that the Prime Minister is not doing a good job. But again, Boris Johnson could not care less, it seems. He seems absolutely unperturbed by the daily reports and rebellions. It's as if he knows that he will keep his office, as if he has some secret leverage. Like we told you, it's a suspense drama. Nothing else explains the recent events better. The news of the lockdown parties broke in November 2021. Ever since, there have been numerous rumors, a lot of speculation on Boris Johnson's exit. No confidence letters have been written. Prospective replacements have been chosen. The Queen has become a year older. The news of 10 Downing Street partying the night before her husband's Prince Philip's funeral has also broken. The police have fined Johnson. His texts with his wife have been leaked. Photos have been leaked. Cost of living in Britain has gone up. Fuel has become more expensive. And yet, Boris Johnson is very much in office. The Tory MP, John Stevenson, claims that he asked Johnson to prove his popularity in the party. Johnson apparently refused. He denied that request. And that forced Stevenson to write a no-confidence letter. The Tory MP says the letter is, and I'm quoting, the only way we are to draw a line under all the recent issues. Fellow MPs could then decide if the Prime Minister is the right person to continue to lead our party and take the Conservative Party into the next election. At least 30 MPs have written similar letters. They've called on Johnson to give up party leadership. The list of rebels includes former Attorney General Jeremy Wright. He claims that the party gate scandal has done lasting damage, not just to the government, but also to its institution and authority. 54 letters of no confidence would trigger a vote. But here's the thing. Boris Johnson came very close to a vote even before this report was published. Some 30 plus letters were sent in. What happened then? The Boris Johnson government escaped death for the ninth time. An inhumane response, among other things, towards the pandemic and growing economic woes is what Boris Johnson has been accused of. And this is one of the reasons why he's facing calls for resignation. But Xi Jinping faces none of those problems. The Chinese president has committed the same mistakes, perhaps worse. The fallout certainly was worse. The Chinese citizens are now paying a price for those mistakes. Zero COVID is hurting the economy. Chinese economy is sinking. Beijing faces a revenue shortfall of close to $1 trillion. It lost $36 billion every month due to these draconian lockdowns. China is reopening again, but the Chinese economy is struggling to bounce back. Here's more. For two months, the city of Shanghai has suffered. It has faced China's harshest lockdown yet. Locals have been caged inside their homes. Patients of the Wuhan virus have been treated like criminals. They were forced into centralized quarantine. That nightmare is now ending. New infections are said to have come down drastically. Shanghai is now reopening. Restrictions in other Chinese cities too are being gradually eased. As these fences outside homes come down, China is counting the cost of the lockdown. Zero Covid has wrecked the Chinese economy. As many as 46 cities were affected in the current wave. 
they faced either a full or a partial lockdown. Lives of more than 300 million citizens were affected. They contribute over six trillion dollars to China's economic output. The lockdowns themselves cost China at least 46 billion dollars every month. They are proving to be unsustainable. Reports say the Chinese government could face a shortfall of cash. The latest assessment says the revenue of the Chinese government has declined. The funding gap could be close to a trillion dollars. How will Beijing bridge this gap? Experts believe the Chinese state could borrow money by issuing bonds. Beijing needs more money. China is planning a stimulus package to revive the economy. The focus is on small and medium state enterprises. They will be given financing and tax rebates to revive their businesses. Companies will also be incentivized to hire fresh university graduates. They'll be entitled to state subsidies. Beijing also wants to spend heavily on infrastructure projects. It wants to build more irrigation projects and transport pipelines. The state will also invest in technology infrastructure. Money will be pumped in to new 5G stations. But that might not be enough to solve China's economic woes. The repeated lockdowns have crippled the economy. Businesses in China have put their expansion plans on hold. They have cut jobs too. Business owners are worried for their future. They fear another lockdown could derail their business. Even China's banks are struggling. They were supposed to lift the economy. China earlier tried to infuse more cash through the banks by encouraging them to lend more. But they can't find new customers. China may have contained the Wuhan virus for now, but its economy is now crying for help. And now let's take a look at what else is making news across the world. This is Gravitas Global Headlines. Israel signed a free trade agreement with the United Arab Emirates. It's the first big trade accord with an Arab state, in a move aimed at boosting trade between the two nations. Canada has unveiled a legislation to implement a national freeze on the sale and purchase of handguns as part of a gun control package that would also limit magazine capacities and ban some toys that look like guns. France has now called for an investigation to probe the killing of a French journalist who died during a Russian bombardment recently. The journalist was near Severodonetsk in eastern Ukraine, covering an evacuation operation. A Spanish Coast Guard boat transported 49 migrants to the port of Arguineguin in Gran Canaria, after they were rescued in the Atlantic Ocean. India's rain-fed agriculture region is set to receive above-normal rainfall this monsoon season, according to the weather office, raising hopes for a bumper farm output and reining in inflation. Two people were killed and 20 others injured after a crash in Nebraska's capital in the United States. According to the police, one person was in a critical condition and the others were treated at hospitals for injuries not believed to be life-threatening. The United Nations and humanitarian agencies have warned that millions of people face severe hunger in the Horn of Africa as the worst drought in more than 40 years could extend to a fifth consecutive failed rainy season. Hurricane Agatha made rainfall on Mexico's southern Pacific coast, bringing torrential rains. The Category 2 storm is the first hurricane to form in the eastern Pacific this year. Well, that's a wrap. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.